Hello and welcome to API Conversations. I'm Marsha Barnhart, API's Chief of Investigations and your host for this Conversations episode number 14 with author Justin Bamforth. Consensus reality, a shared human sense of what's real. We humans all share the same mechanisms to experience our so-called physical world. Our brains essentially all work the same. Our eyes all take in the same wave frequencies. Our bodies all share the same tactile responses, etc. If you looked at the human as a computer system, for example, you might consider that we're all the same make and model with the same operating system, the same peripherals, the same sound cards, the same keyboards, the same upgrade potential, and so on. And we all see and sense the world in the manner that we are programmed to due to our make and model. But we're only seeing what we're programmed to. Many other earthly life forms sense a much wider band of frequencies outside our visual range have a completely different method of sharing information with their own species, and even possess a much keener sense of smell than we do. Take, for example, our trusty canine companions. Our dogs can put their nose to the air and lead us along an invisible trail someone tread hours before. And while this action to the human is tantamount to magic, it is, in fact, merely the dog's different detection device at work. Since we cannot discern outside our capabilities, all of this existing other I just mentioned is essentially non-existent to us because it's non-detectable to us. So, maybe when it comes to the paranormal or otherworldly or other dimensional experiences, these are actual somethings on a different spectrum that we cannot typically detect. The question then becomes what gets changed or modified temporarily that allows the human to detect or become immersed in this other spectrum. How can something that should not be possible or should not exist seemingly be possible or actually exist? Well, I can't answer this, but I can attest to the fact that the impossible does sometimes occur and what shouldn't exist somehow actually on occasion does. And that brings me to today's guest. Author Justin Bamforth has written a book entitled The Spectrum, where he examines multiple stories and first-hand accounts of ordinary people suddenly finding themselves within some weird part of the wide band that comprises the spectrum, an area where the extraordinary and the impossible do occur. Here now is my interview with Justin Bamforth, conducted on November 24th, 2018. We started our conversation with him explaining how he came to write his book. In the first part of the book, I talked a lot about my own personal experiences. And as I was sharing those experiences with other people, I realized that they were telling me about their experiences. And then I just started like collecting all these stories and um, started interviewing people really in depth. And I realized that there were a lot of um, interesting similarities and uh, parallels um, from one case to the next. Mm -hmm. And after a while, I just began to connect the dots and see that all this phenomena, whatever you want to call it, whether it's you know paranormal or UFO cryptid related, it all seems to have all these uh, connection points. And that is essentially what became what I refer to as the spectrum, because the phenomenon uh, seems to take different shapes and forms. And um, that's what we see today. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Now, uh, we need to tell the audience a little bit about your background because that informs much of what you do. Yes, of course. I've been exploring paranormal phenomena, the UFO topic, men in black reports, basically all areas of high strangeness for probably close to two decades now. 
I lecture on the subject, I collaborate with other researchers, I consult with other people worldwide um, to better understand whatever this stuff is. Um, I'm a creative professional by trade. Um, I spend most of my nine to five in advertising and marketing, which is an equally bizarre world of its own. Um, but despite all of this, uh, I still find time to write content from a website, normalparanormal.org. Um, I don't do as many paranormal investigating uh, cases as I used to do, but I've really started um, attending a lot more uh, UFO-related events, and there's so much crossover in this phenomenon. It's, it's uncanny. Yeah. Now, Justin, uh, tell me a little bit about the normal paranormal um, activity or group. I guess it's just you? Yes. It's interesting how normal paranormal came to be. Um, after just looking into all this high strangeness for a while, I wanted to take it a step further, maybe see what others outside, outside of the usual paranormal circles uh, thought of it. Yeah. So it was just a long time ago. I invited a, um, a handful of people to like a small online forum uh, called Normal Paranormal. And that kind of sparked continued conversation into all different topics. That later developed into the current website, blog, and various social media channels that I run now. Mm -hmm. um, it's all under the same name. It serves the same purpose, but it's on a larger scale. And as a result of that, I receive messages from people all over who just want to share their experiences with me or are looking about how to deal with this phenomenon or, you know, anything and everything related to it. Um, and then again, the, the common mindset, right, it's to, is to isolate these experiences into like one category or another. But like, what if they were all related? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so normal paranormal, like just looks at all of it for what it's worth. You know, you take it at face value. Yeah, yeah. Now, this seems like a highly collaborative activity. So you don't do investigations anymore, but you interact with and gather information from other investigators and kind of just kind of keep your fingers in stuff? Yeah, it's it's strange um, how this kind of like, uh, it seems to like pull me in, um, even when I'm not looking for it. it uh, just to give you an example, like there's this uh, small a paranormal bookstore up in uh, Bordentown, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And uh, I pop in there from time to time. And uh, the people who run it are active paranormal investigators. And sometimes they'll uh, get people who come in the store or people that they'll talk with who, you know, they'll have like, I don't know, like a, a missing time episode, or they might think that they have had a nail and abduction case. Um, so they'll kind of like get my take on, on one aspect of that or, um, or, you know, another case that involve like poltergeist activity, they'll bring me in. Um, it, it's all sorts of, it should be collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times with paranormal groups and UFO groups, they're so compartmentalized into just looking at the one angle and that's it. Yeah. But if you, if you kind of foster that, that collaboration, you know, you could, you get a lot more data and a lot more information that way. Yeah, I know um, that it seems pretty bifurcated. There's people who are into the paranormal and people into UFO and aliens. Back in the day, that's kind of how it used to be. And I remember when we first started our organization and, and many other investigative organizations would eschew things about, you know, the paranormal aspect of a particular UFO investigation we were undertaking. And it got to the point with us and many others, that is part of the phenomenon. It may be ancillary to uh, the UFO uh, experience, these strange paranormal things that are occurring with it. And now it seems to have kind of bundled into one large spectrum, so to speak, that you can parse out and look at parts of it, but it all does seem to be related. Absolutely. Well, I would like to uh, discuss some of the better known cases that you write about in your book, Justin? Yeah, so um, I guess, where should we start? Um, I guess probably with the one that, uh, that you worked on, the, uh, the Niagara Falls case. So I know the API looked into the men in black aspect and they covered the UFO part. And uh, you had hinted in our conversation that there was, that there was more to the story. So, so I guess when I was looking at the case with Shane, um, it turns out that there was a, a paranormal aspect to his encounter or his experiences, which was really interesting. Uh -huh. um, it was about a week following his second UFO sighting um, when he was outside cleaning the leaves out of his gutter. 
and out of the corner of his eye, he noticed this, um, this older, shorter man that purchased property, right? So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, he described the man as, as wearing an external jacket. You know, he had a hat. Um, anyways, he approached the property and he just exclaimed to Shane, hey, I built this house. And Shane's like, he comes down off the ladder and he's like, oh, you're the original owner? Man's like, yes, I built this house. Anyway, so they had a conversation. Shane shows him the whole property and the man is really impressed with this, right? Right. Um, he's, he's talking about the trees. He's talking about um, everything that Shane did to his house. And then abruptly, he's like, okay, I'm going to go now. And then he kind of like, sh- I guess, shuffled down the sidewalk but in a weird manner. And uh, as he departed, he, uh, he said to Shane, I'll see you next year. At the time, this didn't seem particularly odd. But right after that, Shane experienced all this poltergeist activity happening in his house for several months. And he and his family were very frightened by what was going on. A few weeks after that incident, he was outside talking with his other neighbor who had lived in that neighborhood for a really long time. And um, Shane uh, told her that hey, I met the original owner of the house. And this lady was really dumbfounded uh, once she heard his description. And uh, she said, you got to be kidding me. That man's dead. He died like 15 years ago. (laughs) So here we have an aspect that could be classified as paranormal related, but yet it came off of a UFO related experience. Mm -hmm. And then you have all this poltergeist, this haunting type activity taking place in his home. Then you have the men in black encounter after all that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But typically, right, with the, with the men in black, they usually trail a UFO sighting, right, or a UFO case. Yeah. Here, this kind of like puts this weird spin on this weird, um, it makes you think about a, a bunch of things. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the cases. Now, the thing about Shane, and we'll use his name because he obviously gave you permission to use his name in your book, correct? Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So um, yes, he did. now Shane was telling me, and we had several conversations about this, uh, about his, and you cover this in the book, when asked to try to look into his his early youth to see if there was any weirdness going on, he did have an experience early on. Detail that. Yes, yes, he did. He, um, he remembers um, being in the seventh grade which would have been sometime in the early 80s. And he and his friends were both, um, they were trying to visit like some new store that opened up in their area. And um, he remembers he had to be back in time for dinner. Um, he remembers the sun setting and uh, his friend noticed this glowing orb coming at them through the trees. Shane remembers the sight being terrifying for some reason. And then they just took off running. But the, the next thing that they remember, or the next thing Shane recalls is he uh, opened up Uh, the front door to his house and his mother asking where he had been. He thought he had just gone to the corner store, but um, he never actually remembers going to the store. He just remembers running from the orb and then boom, he's home. Hmm. It's really strange. I mean, there's, there is also nothing to suggest like a definitive, uh, a time delay apart from his mother telling him that his family had uh, dinner an hour ago without him. There are, um, an awful lot of things that come to mind on that, you know, when you, when we get into looking at when the men in black came and visited him at the, or looking for him at the hotel, I know that you mentioned to Shane, I mean, it was obvious, uh, shouldn't these guys have known he wasn't going to be here? What was that about? How could they not know that? To what degree do these people have some kind of uh, extra sense? And to what degree are they either stupid or doing something we cannot figure out? They must have known he wasn't there, but they came. Yeah, it, it, exactly. It, it brings up these questions like, yeah, the men in black are so terrifying, right? They're so threatening. They, they have this ability to read people's minds, to make things disappear. Um, but yet, on the other hand, they seem dumb as rocks, or they seem like not quite with it. I mean, even in how they're described with their physical actions, it just doesn't seem perfect. It seems almost like, too perfect. Uh-huh. And therefore, it comes off as imperfect. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the questions Shane and I wrestled with for a, for a while in our conversations is, if these individuals can read minds, mm. it, it doesn't appear that they have very smart minds operating within themselves. Because mm-hmm. um, yeah, they shouldn't, they should have known he was not there. And that, yet they picked a day to arrive at his place of employment. 
when he wasn't there? I mean, really? Yeah. It's just really bizarre. Yeah. And, and another aspect of this case, for a while, Shane was imbued with some kind of power or whatever that when he would pass under a street lamp, for example, it would dim and go out. And he had this kind of phenomenon um, associated with his being for a while, too. It's it's just what is going on? Yeah. And I mean, for what it's worth, too, when we uh, shortly after we talked, he had described to me that some of the activity was seemed to be uh, picking up again mm. uh, in his home. Oh. Um, and his his wife and his family was beginning to get a little bit more concerned again. But then I told him, you know, let's just not focus on it. Let's just not think about it too much. And, you know, that was about, that was it. That was the last I really heard of it. But every once in a while, um, he'll, he'll send me a message and, you know, a, another event is taking place, not on the level as it was back then, uh-huh. but just small things. Yeah. Like he was doing some, uh, or he's doing some recent uh, home renovations, and that seemed to have uh, kicked up some activity, which is also a common thing in uh, the paranormal world. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. So it makes you kind of think. Um, so did Shane come through with special abilities, and that kind of was a magnet to the other spectrum of things, or did he come through and the spectrum glommed onto him, and now he's a magnet for such things? It's uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg here? Uh, that's another thing I wrestle with a lot. Yeah, exactly. Like, why certain people and not others? And why does it seem like this phenomenon, um, it appears to people, but not when they really want it to. Mm-hmm. It's always when they least expect it, or... Um, or when they're least prepared for it. And I guess that says something about, you know, when we're trying to investigate it too, right? Yeah, some of the, yeah. Some of the best pieces of evidence happen when we're not ready, when we don't even have the recorders on. Yeah, but you know, there are more and more reports. I don't know if if one can believe them because there's a lot of untruth in this field. Yeah. But there are some people who are seemingly, for lack of a better term, conjuring these things. Uh, you know, they're going into a light state of meditation and apparently pulling in this phenomena to occur upon request. Have you run into that much, Justin? Yeah. So um, it's really strange because I think it was, um, was it Albert Bender, right? Yeah. He was, um, I guess, that's where we can kind of trace like the modern day men in black report to, right. Is, mm-hmm. is the case of Albert Bender. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you actually look into um, Albert Bender's um, backstory, uh, some people who really knew him uh, said that he was conjuring up these things. Um, so did that open up a door? Mm. You know, we can only speculate, but it, it's certainly worth speculating on. Now, this Men in Black case that we discussed here is just one in hundreds, thousands of cases. I mean, there were some uh, things I read in your book, many things that I had never read about before. Uh, For example, that one where this guy kept getting telephone calls um, and recording these telephone calls of this robotic type voice. Now, give us a good full uh, explanation on that case, if you would. Uh, Yes. uh, So that would be the Gary Sugrant case. Mm -hmm. Um, Gary was a, he was an Air Force captain, and he lived, his family lived in the Long Island, New York area, but he was stationed in um, San Antonio, Texas, I believe. Gary decided to take an unannounced surprise trip to visit his family and friends who, you know, back in Long Island. Um, he didn't really make a big deal of it, and uh, in fact, he didn't really, I, th- I don't think he really notified uh, the people on the base there, so no one knew about his trip, right, except for Gary. So as he was uh, boarding the aircraft, um, there were these two weird men who approached him. And um, one asked him, uh, approached him with a pen and pad and asked what his name was. And Gary was hesitant to answer because mainly he didn't want to get in trouble. And the guy responded with, you know, don't worry, you won't get in trouble. I just want to get some information from you. Now, here's the weird thing, right? So Gary has like a great memory. He can recall intricate details of almost everything. Yet, for some strange reason, he can't recall exactly what they were talking about at the airport. Um, So that was with the first guy. Um, He just remembers that um, it just stood out to him as a little weird. And then once he was actually on the plane itself, there was a a second guy who approached him and wanted to know what his name was again. And Gary was like getting really 
irritated with this guy because he just insisted. Even when like um, the uh, the stewardess came over and asked the guy to leave, you know, because he wasn't in the right seat, the guy just kept insisting. So eventually, Gary he remembers telling him his name, but that was it. But then he also remembers um, being very concerned with who these two guys were. So when he, I think when he got back to New York, he, uh, he called his apartment manager just to check up on his place while he was gone because he thought that these guys were you know, going to break into his place or who knows what was going to happen there. He knew it was weird. Yeah, he knew it was weird. He knew it was just out of place. That, that same day that he arrived in New York, he and his father um, met with another UFO investigator. He was, he was the director of a big UFO organization. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was called the Intercontinental UFO Research and Analytic Network. Um, his name was Coleman von Kovetsky, I think. You pronounce his name. You know, uh, excuse me if I'm butchering that name. But um, <laughs> anyways, so... Uh, Von Kovetsky was the official or the unofficial spokesman for the UFO hearings at the United Nations um, back when they actually brought up this topic um, back in, I think it was 1978. Do you remember that? Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Von Kovetsky was a good friend with the organizer, the prime minister of Granada, uh, Sir Eric yes. Gary. Um, mm-hmm. So anyways, uh, Gary and his father, they're talking to this guy about um, one of uh, Gary's father's sightings. After they returned from this meeting, um, Gary placed a call to his longtime friend, Mike, right, who had, again, no prior knowledge of him being in town. At least that's what Gary thought. It wasn't until he gave Mike a call that Mike claimed, hey, Gary, you you already called me. Uh, We already spoke the previous day. And according to what Mike told Gary, this impersonator, if you want to call it that, sounded as if he had like a stuffy nose and was coming down off the cold. Gary was like, what are you talking about? Like, I did not call you. It wasn't me. And in fact, the impersonator had mentioned that he had flown in through LaGuardia Airport. But Gary had actually come in through JFK. Um, hmm. So here he's placed in this weird, confusing man, this confusing state, right? So then he gets ready to end his phone call with Mike. But another call came in because, um, you know, this was in the days of call waiting. Gary picks it up, and from that point on, just everything changed. There was this mechanical voice or robotic voice, however you want to describe it, that greeted him on the line. And again, here's the, here's the weird thing. Gary just instinctively pressed record um, on his answering machine to record the call. So did something tell him to press record, or did he just do it because he wanted to? You know, both of these are possible scenarios. Um, either way, the voice warned him, um, or actually just kept asking if, if Gary Sudberg was there. And um, it, it's, it's just really creepy. And Gary's like, like who is this? Like, the, the caller never identifies who he is. The caller just keeps repeating the same thing. Is Gary Sudberg there? How long are you going to be back from Texas? You're being impersonated by the other voice. How long are you going to be back from Texas? You're being impersonated by the other voice. Is Gary Sudbrink there? It just keeps going through these same questions. And it's not even, you know, when Gary and I were uh, kind of like looking at the, or, you know, thinking about these calls, they don't even like come across as like proper English or proper grammar. Um, one of the questions that the caller says is, so how long are you going to be back from Texas? which doesn't even make any sense, right? Um, so again, it's like, what are we dealing with here? Like, like robotic dummies? What did he ever figure out on that? Well, Gary thinks that these were more closely related to the men in black, although he's never had an actual face-to-face encounter with the men in black. And for what it's worth, too, Gary has never had an actual UFO sighting either. His family has, not him. He had no interest in this stuff. I mean, he had like, oh. he had a little bit of a knowledge on it because mm-hmm. uh, his family was, was kind of into it based on their experiences. But he himself, he didn't investigate this stuff. He didn't look into it. It was just that he and his father were, were there to talk to another UFO investigator. But they weren't, they themselves weren't investigating this stuff. Now, for also, what's interesting to note is the sighting that they were telling this other investigator, Gar- um, Again, that was Gary's father. And also, mm-hmm. 
it was Gary's uncle. Gary's father and his uncle, they had heard of, there's this place in West Virginia called the Green Bank Observatory. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There was an incident that took place there where the observatory went down. I don't know how they came to this conclusion, but Gary's father and his uncle thought that the reason that observatory went down was because a UFO had cut it down with a laser. Justin, isn't that the SETI um, array? Um, the search for extraterrestrials at Green Bank? Right. It's not, it may, I don't want to say that it is associated with SETI. I know that it was, um, it was a radio astronomy observatory. What's interesting is uh, they thought that a UFO had cut that down with a laser. Um, so they were actually en route to check it out, right? Again, Gary's father and his uncle. While they were en route to that location, that's when they had their UFO sighting. And that is what they explained to the other investigator back in New York. I see. But the phone calls, you know, why did, why did this robotic voice call Gary? Um, and it didn't just call him that one night. It actually called him three times that same night. And a fourth time the following night. Man. And when it called, it, st- it just kept like, it kept saying different things. But again, in that. Strange voice. Yeah, the strange voice and the repeated uh-huh, structure. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, so it was uh-huh. really bizarre stuff. I-, I was just wondering what he ever made of that. What, where is this Gary now and what, what happened there? So the voice actually had given him instructions mm. and said, um, and said uh, keep, your, keep an eye on the skies uh, near Orion. And then it, it said things like, the full moon show double from you. It, it just didn't make any sense. So that night, they actually went outside and they, they looked out at the, um, at the nighttime sky and they didn't see anything. Um, on the, the second night, the caller come, calls back and said, had some other information along the lines of, um, we come to be within this planet to visit the many to be contacted as the same with you. Again, it's that broken sentence structure, too. It's really bizarre. And then it said, Mm -hmm. um, beware, government interference, visitations to be disrupted by them. What does that mean? And for the longest time, you know, Gary and his family, they contemplated these things. They reflected on them. Nothing bizarre happened. And to this day, nothing really has come of it. Um, There was an incident. Uh, involving kind of like that, uh, that doppelganger type stuff with Gary and one of his brothers at one point. Um, but this was prior to the phone call. I don't remember exactly when it was like in relationship to 1993, but it was, mm-hmm. it was before. Um, so Gary has two brothers, right? He has um, Stephen and Brian. And um, while um, going to a wedding also in the Long Island area, uh, his brother Stephen saw Gary drive up alongside him, make weird faces to get his attention, and then just simply drive off. Now, here's the thing. Even though Gary was in Long Island at that time, he he didn't have a car to drive, let alone the car he was apparently spotted in by his brother was the exact same make and model of the very same vehicle that was parked in his residence back in San Antonio, Texas at the time. So what is that? Was that related? It makes you just scratch your head. Well, there's no place to put that. It's one of those things that you just look at and go, whoa, and just <laughs> toss over your shoulder into the anomaly box. Right. What do you do with that? It's just... Yeah. And there are multiple stories of that type. Exactly. So where is Gary now? So Gary, um, excuse me, Gary has recently moved to uh, Las Vegas. Um, he actually used to live in Pennsylvania, uh-huh. not far from me. Oh, but uh, I had heard of this case from another MUFON investigator who was covering this case. But this case was also, was also touched on by uh, Linda Moulton Howe, mm. like almost immediately after it had taken place. Um, I had heard it in passing on one of the Art Bell shows. But, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of information gets, gets muddied and a lot of information gets um, twisted as it goes down the chain of command, right? right? So that's why I thought, okay, you know, I, sure, I just sure. want to get in touch with this guy directly, find out what happened. And then that's when we started talking about all these other aspects that have happened, that have happened in his life, like these um, 
phantom helicopters. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right, which is another aspect to the phenomenon of like, where do you put that into, right? Yeah. What I've noticed is that there's this, um, you know, there's this little known angle, um, especially with UFO reports, where these helicopters will just show up. Mm -hmm. And and the, I guess the, the, the common perception is that, oh, they must be law enforcement or, or government, right? Like monitoring the situation. Right. But when you actually look at the reports, that may not be the case, especially when they shape shift into different things or they show up like without any sound uh, at like UFO witnesses' homes or nearby. Mm -hmm. um, and then they just vanish. It's weird stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Now this, this, you see um, a continuation of kind of the same strange phenomenons these black helicopters um the men in black uh shape-shifting objects and so you want to think that they're made up except that they keep happening in disparate parts of the country to different people at different times essentially the same same kind of phenomenon keeps getting played out. I don't know what to make of that. What's your thoughts on it? <laughs> it's, uh, it's downright bizarre. It's puzzling. It's fascinating. And it's frustrating. Hmm. That's the best way I can describe it. Yeah. Um, but I think we do, as investigators and researchers, we do a disservice to ourselves when we want to, like, put it into a certain category or a certain box uh -huh. or a certain classification system yeah. so that we can, and, and I understand why we do that. We do it because we want to just kind of make some sort of organization or, or make some sort of sense of all this chaos, but sure, we could be kind of like overlooking other aspects that are just as important mm -hmm. as the experience itself. Yeah. And one of these things that I realized while writing the book is, yes, the experience is important, right? but also the, the witness's perception or their response to the experience. That is going to be just as telling yeah. about the phenomenon as the phenomenon itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say uh, there's probably a lot of research in that area right now, the perception aspect of that, because, you know, there's many instances, and I had one myself, where you will see this very strange object, and other people driving by in the highway didn't even slow down. Not only are they not looking up at what I'm looking at, they aren't even slowing down as if it doesn't exist. So who's seeing what? Are they seeing the actual nothing, and I'm seeing a phenomenon that doesn't really exist or am I seeing what exists and they for some reason have their their detection devices closed to it that happens a lot right yeah exactly it's um I'm so glad that you brought that up because you know going back to the Gary Sudbrink case um he remembers an incident where he uh he saw a helicopter you know just floating there at like low altitude um right outside of his apartment complex and yet there was one of his neighbors or one of the apartment tenants was outside washing his car, didn't even notice this thing. And, um, it, it, you know, Gary was, I remember him telling me, he, him saying, like, it would seem so ridiculous uh, to even ask him because how could you not see it? Yeah. You know, yet it was, it seemed like a stupid question of him to ask him if he did, if he did see it. So he didn't. Yeah. You know, that, that, sh that shows another aspect, right? Like, why didn't he just approach him and just ask him about it anyways? I, I come across this with so many of the other reports, too. Like, these witnesses are experiencing crazy phenomenon. They're also seeing other people who are experiencing the same phenomenon, and they won't even approach them. They'll just brush it off as if nothing happened and just go about their day. Uh -huh. And I've always wondered, like, is that, like, what causes that? Is it, is it our reaction to the phenomenon or is it the phenomenon itself? Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit later in this show. Um, hit exactly that. Now, give us a few more examples of what you found some of your more extraordinary, I mean, these are all extraordinary, but some of the other lesser known real phenomenon that you uh, investigated from firsthand witnesses. One of the people that I interviewed for the book was um, an author and researcher. Her name was uh, uh, Marie B. Jones. Mm -hmm. And um, she, she's written a bunch of this stuff. And she, uh, she looked into this phenomenon as well. 
but she used to actually run a um, an abduction group out in Southern uh, California. And when they were looking into this, strange things would happen with them. Um, she received a, a weird phone call from, um, again, this strange robotic had phone call, but it was more threatening. And it would be more concerned with um, the ongoings of, uh, of her group instead of her, her uh, instead of herself. So it would say things like, um, you know, your group is familiar with this abductee or, or that abductee or, you, you know, you know, this person or that person. Um, just to basically kind of like give it the creeps in a way, like it was like observing you or monitoring you. But then it started getting really creepy when it actually um, started uh, calling out like what book she was reading at that particular time or what she did at uh, different points in her life that nobody else knew about. Uh -huh. Weird stuff. So, but again, we want to argue if you're involved in the phenomenon, if you're involved, if you're involved in the topic, right? Are you attracting that attention? And does the phenomenon, like the more aware of the phenomenon you become, does the phenomenon become more aware of you? You know, because after they kind of, after they uh, terminated that group, the activities decided they didn't really get any more, or she didn't really get any more phone calls. But the other person who was involved with the group, she got some strange things happening to her too. But then they kind of lost touch and that was it. And they never looked back. Well, I'll tell you, when when I was reading the book, I was interested in the aspect of perception, you know, and you were talking about theophany and some of the terms that, that are used, you know, Ingo Swan, he used analytic overlay and reality hopper, and these speak to the perception of the human reality, which is kind of, um, mm -hmm. when you take a 50,000 foot view, to me, it kind of looks like we're talking about the perception on the human being. I don't know if this is just some system interacting with us, you know, like Jacques Vallée. The last I really heard from him, he was very caught up with the idea that this is some type of system that that is interacting with the human for some reason. It might not even be actual physical things that are happening. It might be just a perceptual overlay of things to, to see how the human will react or to, well, I don't know for what purpose it is, but that's where this these terms of analytical overlay come in, that the human trying to make sense of some of these things that are happening to them. So I found that kind of interesting. Yeah, wasn't it uh, Jacques Vallée who said he would be disappointed if UFOs turn out to be nothing more than spaceships? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it could be that what we're dealing with may not have any like uh, physical makeup whatsoever. It could just be like what we're perceiving it or what we're expecting it to be is what it shows up as. There's this one researcher, MJ Benias, right? He brings up this great point in that we don't exactly know where the physical connection lies between the UFO seen as a physical object uh -huh. and the person that sees it. Uh -huh. Is the witness truly seen a physical machine or is a human brain simply interpreting the UFO to look like something that we can better identify with, whether it's a saucer, a triangle, a glowing sphere? And that, um, that model might change depending upon where our society is at. I mean, take, for instance, like the, uh, the classic, you know, UFO, right? Right. The, um, the classic disc-shaped craft. Right. Um, those things were, were seen all the time, right? Now you rarely hear about them in comparison to like flying triangles or these, now this, um, this glowing orb that is very prevalent in ufology right now. Um, when I took a look at the, the MUFON case reports just for this year, it seems like the sphere is still the most widely reported shape. Uh -huh. Now, that could mean a bunch of things. Either the occupants behind the craft have traded up their old equipment, or we've traded in our expectations of the craft. In other words, like maybe as we evolve as a society, like our expectations of what we think highly advanced aerial technology or the UFOs evolves too. I mean, it's all great things to think about, right? Yeah, yeah. There, there is a lot of thought about that. You're talking like uh, the culture. Uh, is the culture seeing things right. that are going to fit within their paradigm? Um, and so they're going to right. make sense of this, this 
floating salad bowl or whatever, or their tribal drink bowl, (laughs) and that will kind of get incorporated. That's how they are going to make sense of this thing that they witnessed uh, and and indoctrinated into their ability to understand. And and I think there's certainly truth to that. I mean, there's no way we're going to prove or disprove that. Um, I, I do know that for a long time, it used to be that people thought of the triangular craft as a recent phenomenon. And then I read uh, mm-hmm. the book, uh, Triangular UFO, An Assessment of the Situation by uh, Marler. And he talked about there were reports of large floating triangular craft exactly as they're talked about now center light pulsing you know and lights on the periphery exactly that in the 1880s in alaska wow i mean that's fact it's on record and so that you know thinking it only goes so far this cultural thing people were seeing stuff that uh, just now can we imagine could be possible. They were seeing that way back in the day and the very, very yeah. famous uh, back from uh, somewhere in old Germany where they had a block print of this this gigantic uh, UFO right. war overhead. Now, that block print yeah. includes shapes of flying things that we still are not reporting. We are not reporting some of these things that are, that are showing there. We're reporting now some, uh, flying cross type things that are slightly off axis, but there's other stuff on there that nobody reports that was engraved as a fact of the matter of what the populace witnessed. So that cultural thing has some merit, but it doesn't travel all the way, Justin. It only travels part of the way. Yeah. It's an totally enigma. Agree. Right. Like, I'm not trying to, like, um, discount that point at all. But right. When you look at, like, these mass sightings, like these tremendous, you know, hundreds of people, if not thousands of people seeing the same object mm-hmm. in comparison to back then, it's like there's a lot more people seeing these, these certain shapes in comparison. The Phoenix Lights was one. There were thousands of witnesses to that. Correct. Yeah. And yet we've never had uh, an event on that caliber ever, really. I mean, as far as like, you know, that triangle type craft or that delta shaped craft. Um, here's a better example, right? Uh-huh. The evolution of these alien beings. Uh-huh. You know, prior to um, the modern age of ufology, as we consider it, you know, the late 1940s, mm-hmm. the, the alien entities, they were referred to as witches or demons. Yeah. And yet in the 1950s and 60s, people said, no, no, they come from Mars. Then it changed to Venus. Then the reports became a little bit more sophisticated in the 70s. They're from Alpha Centauri or Zeta Reticuli. Mm -hmm. In the 1990s, it evolved into another galaxy, then another dimension. Now people view them as possibly being from another time or reality, maybe even us. It keeps shifting, right? The phenomenon, it's still doing the same thing, right? It's just, who are these forces? I would say, though, that some of these explanations, if the witnesses are to be believed, some of these explanations are coming from the phenomenon itself. These creatures are telling right. the witness standing dumbfounded in front of it. Yeah, see that star there? That's Zeta Reticuli. And we, we come from that second star right there. Well, the witness didn't pull that out of his, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. He right. was fed that information. Right. And um, that is the case with many of these things. People say, gosh, you look, here you are, son. I mean, again, dumbfounded in front of this thing because you just underwent an experience out of the twilight zone. And here is this being, this pretty looking blonde thing that says, yes, we're you from the future. The witness didn't make that up. Right. They just got that downloaded yeah. from the phenomenon. So that's right. weird, too. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I guess what I'm trying to say is we should be very careful to make a definitive conclusion as to what uh-huh. The UFO shape looks like, yeah, or what it has, or what it will look like, yes. Just as much as you know, what the alien, if you want to call it that, or the extraterrestrial, ultra terrestrial, whatever, who they are, where they're from, what their MO is, we should be very careful because the perceptions keep changing, the the information that they're projecting keeps evolving and and um, morphing into other things. Yeah, we just have to like look at it, yeah. just take it all in write it down, make the notes, and file it away, right? Yeah, except you have to accept that something 
is interacting with us. But yeah. but to make oh, yeah. any judgment call on what it is, we just do not have enough data to have any clue what these disparate things are. What right. When you look at them as a holistic thing, we see a mm-hmm. mishmash of nothing and everything. We can make nothing of it as a holistic right. understanding. Yep, absolutely. And um, I guess pulling it like full circle here with Ingo Swan and what he called the reality hopper, mm-hmm. you know, people do this all the time when they're, when they experience something that they're not familiar with, you know, it's the mind to, to kind of like fill in the unknown with what fits their known. Yeah. Um, it's basically like an attempt to make sense of the chaos. Sure. Um, and in a certain way, also with like, um, you know, we'll, we'll use the Christian Bible as an example with the theophany, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which is the visible manifestation of a deity, the humankind. Whenever, you know, God in the Christian Bible appeared to people, he appeared never in his truest form, but just various forms that could be physically observed. You know, things like burning bushes or pillars of clouds or fire or a storm. You know, he would take on the form of angels or several angels. One could argue, you know, then he took on the human form of Jesus. So, you know, whatever this phenomenon is, could be operating from within the same realm. Uh-huh. We have to take the experience, face value, write it down, make note of it, and then just look for all these similarities, all these patterns. Yeah. But one pattern that keeps emerging over and over is this, you know, when, when we're dealing with paranormal phenomenon or UFO phenomenon or whatever, is this deception thing. Why are these forces never telling us their true intentions? Why are they never telling us the true world. Why does the story keep changing with them? It's not the witness's fault. It may not be. It may be the phenomenon. Yeah. Um, it may be, uh, there may be a reason for this, maybe to stay covert or to stay, you know, hidden. Um, it seems like the phenomenon wants to operate on its terms, right? Yeah. So it, it's a head scratcher. Yes. But th- there's no doubt something is happening to these people. Though. You know, different witnesses um, seem to, and again, going on the f- the notion that this could be real. I mean, it could all be absolute, just smoke and mirrors. But if it is actual and factual, different witnesses appear to be interacting with different factions and different types of of beings. And those different factions seem to be feeding different information. One faction might feed to them that, oh yes, it's very important that you take care of the earth. And then they show them a bunch of these visions about how the earth will be ruined if they don't. Another faction says, yes, you, this group of people here is um, special and we're going to be taking you with us. And so different factions seem to be feeding different lines. Now, is it the all, all the same in different guises, who knows? Again, we we simply do not know that. We just cannot know. But an awful lot of this information or disinformation seems to be fed by the very phenomenon itself. It's like a gigantic mind mess. Right. But I now I want to talk a bit about the fact that that if we look at it as being a real tangible thing, not mind perceptions and hallucinations somehow triggered by this phenomenon. If we're talking about it being an actual experience that human beings are undergoing, this brings up the fascinating thing of all the times abductees have talked about literally dissolving through the roof and going into a spaceship or through a wall or through a closed window. Mm -hmm. That is where I I wish that we had the ability. I wish that people who had this knowledge and had the wherewithal and the resources would start collating some of this information. That should tell us something. How can a human being be brought right through a roof being unscathed by it. How does that happen? Unless you start thinking about maybe when we're looking at quantum physics, is the answer there Mm -hmm. that normal physics is our perceptual overlay? Quantum physics is the actual world. And we know in the quantum world, there are vast differences between one particle to the next, so much so you, you can drive a Mack truck through it 
in essence, when you're down at that quantum world. So it would be, and I know some physicists and theoretical physicists are getting into this quantum aspect of something going on below our programmed normal world of normal physics. That is kind of where it seems to me answers will be found of that aspect of this phenomenon. But you also talk about, and, and I've read about what they call the Oz effect, Right. Everything gets quiet. Like this zone of quiet came over, a bell came down over and covered uh, a portion of the forest and all the sound quit. That is recorded over and over and over. And the amnesia that occurs with witnesses, and that's happened with me, where you you forget to tell somebody Five minutes after you saw the most extraordinary thing in your life, uh -huh. you forgot to tell somebody that you just saw the most extraordinary thing you've ever seen in your life. Until six months later, you're peeling a banana and say, wow, you know what? I just remember. And then off comes this story that you're thinking, how could I have forgotten that? This is weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, again, one of these common aspects of the phenomenon, right? It's this... Uh this manipulation aspect yeah manipulation right it's um I, I love how you talk about it like I, I consider it like the witness disinterest right all of a sudden they're not interested in, in it or but you have something extraordinary happened like what the heck why wouldn't you tell, tell everybody about this yeah um yeah there was um there was some uh great case or some great examples of this um when the phoenix lights because we were just talking about that recently uh -huh. um Filmmaker James Fox, right? He he uh, interviewed some hospice workers who were present at the time, um, who actually saw the lights appear and disappear. Yet they didn't mention a single word about it during the actual event. Fox said that one woman told him that they just went right back to their tea, as if nothing unusual ever took place. Uh -huh. The state director of Arizona Mufon, Jim Mann, he claims that he spoke with an individual who stopped his car on the side of the road, watched this as several others. Uh, took note of this huge craft slowly gliding overhead, but yet not a word was spoken. And after a passed by, everyone got in a car, drove home. Um, even actor Kurt Russell, right? He uh -huh. he was flying his his plane when he saw, you know, one of these Phoenix lights go over, and he radioed into the tower, right, to inform him that their radar systems were not showing any aircraft. And Russell thought. Nothing of the event. He completely forgot about it yeah. until he saw a documentary on the Phoenix Lake, yeah. which stirred up memories of his own sighting. So he went back to check his log, like on the day of the flight, and somehow he forgot to record the event. What the heck? How does this happen? <laughs> I don't know where to put that. I don't know where to put that. I don't know how we should call it or how we should refer to it as a witness disinterest or, you know, witness amnesia. It's, it's one of these aspects, right? It's like when we look at how the experience has an impact on the, on the experiencer, that might give us some sort of clue as to how the phenomena operate. Yeah. Yeah, that goes to the case of manipulation. But if this is a, an actual physical thing taking place, take, for example, another thing that, that people always talk about, you know, if these, these things don't want to be seen and they haven't apparently, to my knowledge, landed actually on the White House lawn and greeted, um, the president, uh, they apparently don't want to be seen except every once in a while when they do want to be seen and they have all these lights go on and then they fly over a hugely, uh, populated area like Phoenix. They don't want to be seen until they want to be seen. And here's another interesting thing. When, reading about the Glemsford case, where this UFO, it illuminates, but the light does not touch the ground. And then you get to thinking about uh, these cases of where witnesses are told how they, they're brought inside the ship and say, ah, see, you do this little thing here and it makes it move like that. So some witnesses are being downloaded the technology of a craft. So here now we're forced to think about an actual craft with an actual technology that is almost something that we can put our our uh, hands around and make sense of an actual technical craft that is piloted by beings somewhat like ourselves that takes it beyond a uh, strange phenomenon to just a high technical 
civilization that's interacting with us. That makes it a real thing. That's happening a lot too. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it could be that maybe the phenomenon is both physical and also non-physical, right? Maybe it's because there's no doubt it's leaving a physical uh, mark in our reality, but it's also being observed doing things that just cannot be. And maybe that's why it drives it drives science so like or scientists like so crazy, right? Because they can't yes. measure it, they can't control it under their terms, right? In our known, you know, under our known uh, laws of physics, right? right? Because it, it's it's operating, it's operating within it, but also on the outskirts of it. And I think investigators and researchers, we should also approach the phenomenon um, knowing this. We should not approach it in a way that to us logically makes sense, like a, like a linear fashion. We need to kind of rethink how we even approach it. Yeah. And the more that we can do that, maybe if it wants to, if the phenomenon is clearly in control and if it wants to reveal itself, maybe it will. But um, maybe that will help us or at least help us to have less headaches in the end. Yeah, I don't know that the human being does not like dissonance. That's why they fight any paradigm shift. They will fight it sometimes yeah. with their very life because the mind sometimes cannot yeah. bend the way it must bend to take in new information. And you see that in a tiny, tiny way in the scientific community. I was just reading an article, and you may have read it too, about how a couple of scientists doing some extraordinary, elegant tests found out that... Every human being alive today, according to their tests, came from a single man and a single woman, and that 90% of the animals here on Earth today are only 100,000 to 200,000 years old. Now, I bring this up because the scientist, one of them, was quoted as saying he fought this every step of the way. He fought that data that was staring him in the face because he could not, as a scientist, go there until he had no place else to go, except that that data was saying that. This happens to the human being all the time. We just cannot go there and don't. And it happens to science all the time. They cannot go there, so they don't. What we need are people who finally say, it's okay, I'm going to go there. It's not going to kill me. Some scientists are kind of being forced into going there because they are, God bless them, following the data. This stuff should not be happening. The data says this is. How can I explain that? And then they start an honest search for truth. That's what we need more of. And I just wish we were getting more of it. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's why, you know, some people who read my book, they read the spectrum, they, they get frustrated because I present all these different angles. I present all these different questions. And not enough answers, right? But you can't. You, you, you don't have enough data to formulate our answers. I can only just put the information out there and you tell me what it is. <laughs> I would love to know, but I don't think the phenomenon necessarily wants us to know exactly what it is. And, and if we're... Apparently. Yeah. But the, the more of these interesting cases that, that we come across, like... I, you know, I'm kind of, I get a little bored with the stereotypical ghost cases or the stereotypical UFO cases. Like, tell me the stuff that doesn't fit into a box, mm. that cannot be categorized. Like, just the overall high strangeness. I want to hear about that mm -hmm. because there might be some information in there uh, Yeah, that might be more common than we thought. Uh -huh. It's just like, right, when, um, when the cryptozoologists out there, they, they're studying Bigfoot, right, as you know, a, a specific creature, yet yeah. for a while they're ignoring the reports of UFOs being sighted in the vicinity of Bigfoot, right? Uh-huh. Same thing with the UFO guys. They were ignoring the fact that, well, some of these craft are actually dropping off Bigfoot into certain locations. Yeah. Again, there's this crossover. Or like when um, abductees will report uh, seeing deceased relatives on board the craft. Well, there's the paranormal tie-in. Yeah. It's yeah. weird, yeah, but it's there. Yeah. Yeah, we can't make sense of it. And it's irresponsible to try. And I value that in your book, too. You don't know what's going on. You're just reporting what people are telling you in all honesty, looking you dead in the face, yeah. knowing that they're going to look like a nut. But this happened to me. And you wrote it in your book. But you don't know what the heck this is. We're all searching for that. People who think they know the answers, well, they only have one little part 
of this phenomenon. I don't think there is a human alive that can grasp the whole of it. I don't think we have the ability as we are right now, some extraordinary thing's going to have to happen to us for us to fully understand this phenomenon in all its moving parts. Do you ever wonder, like, if it will ever happen? Like, if we'll ever reach that point where the information is finally revealed 100%, like, okay, guys, this is what it is. Do you ever think we'll see that day? I honestly do not. Uh-uh. No. No. I'm right there with you. I don't, I don't think so either. You know, I... I suppose if we die at one point, we may have a lot more information on the other side than what we have now, because as the, this human vessel that we're in is very specialized and it can only do X, Y, Z. It, it can't do A to Z. It only can do a few things here. And it is in this yeah. dimension, it is embodied and, and it is uh, governed you know, it's got governors on what we can do and what we can understand. And as long as we're here, I mm -hmm. think we, we are under these strictures. We can only know X amount. And that's probably part of the game of being here. I don't know. I don't know anything either. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I can't help but think back to like places like Skinwalker Ranch, for example. Oh, yeah. You know, when, um, you know, there you had science people there studying the phenomenon you know, 20, around the clock, mm -hmm. like for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And they still came away with the uh, same questions we do today. Yeah. You know, what is it? What, where is this coming from? You know, and they got the impression that it was playing games with them, that it was operating under terms that, that it was in charge of, that it was in control of. You know, it was, we'd be very naive to think that we have more um, control over this just because we're human. Yeah, it's laughable. And that, I think that aspect really scares me and really disturbs me. Because when you look at like the deception angles to this or the manipulation aspects of it, uh -huh. um, that's scary stuff. That's like, what does that suggest? Yeah. Like, um, you know, does the phenomenon need us more than we think? Hmm. Like, um, or does it not need us? Hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, it's like, it's, it's strange. It's, it just brings up more questions than answers. Yeah. Well, if we are its plaything, uh, we have been since time immemorial, and there's nothing I'm going to do about it um, except just kind of go along for the ride. It's been yeah. around. It has been with us. You know, some people contend it's been with us before there was an us. Right. So I, I don't even, I don't know. I don't know a thing. I typically, when I interview, I... I like to say in the end, so what are your thoughts on what the heck this is? But we've essentially, you and I have been giving our thoughts on yeah, what the heck this that. is. We don't know what the heck this is. That's the bottom line. Uh, we don't know, but we're searching. Yeah. And it's the search that is most fascinating. Um, and if we never find anything out, we still went on an interesting journey. Even though we never found the end of the rainbow, we still got to look at the rainbow. Yeah, it, it's a... Uh... <laughs> This multi-faceted, multi-dimension, multi-colored rainbow or spectrum. Yeah, <laughs> if you want to call it that. Um, exactly. It, where it where it starts, where it ends, I, your guess is as good as mine. I I have no idea, but it's still fascinating, and there's no denying, right, that something is taking place. Yep. Yep. It, we're, we're beyond that question now of if the phenomenon is real or not. It is clearly real. There's something happening. There's just too much overwhelming evidence. Yet, we just need to approach it from a different way or maybe rethink how we're currently approaching it. Yeah, I, I feel at this point that if there is somebody who, who yes, they can, they'll, they'll take the safe route. Well, in all this universe, there should be something out there. Yeah. But if, for somebody to say, no, this, none of this stuff, it's just all crap made up, I, I have to say that person is part of this this ball called the willful ignorant. You cannot mm -hmm. look into this with an open mind at all. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, scientists. Right. I'm sorry. But if you actually look into some of these things, you have to put it in the anomaly category. Right. We can't explain it, but these things are happening. And much of what is being reported has happened throughout antiquity, continues to happen, and we still don't have a handle on it. But to deny that such things are occurring is willful ignorance.
Yeah, it, well said. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you with you anymore. It's uh, but it's also like it's tough because I, I think the extreme believers are just as bad as extremes, extreme skeptics. Oh, true that, true that. They're <laughs> part of the problem, not the solution. Right? Yeah. It's like yeah, yeah. You know, there are people like, oh no, I know this is beings from another world, or or I know this was ghosts. This is my deceased grandfather or whatnot. Oh, okay, great. What if it's not? But maybe not. <laughs> yeah. What if it's not? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, you're right. Both of those sides are equally difficult yeah. to um, accept. I was going to say, like, uh, earlier in our conversation, when you were, were you giving me some, you know, counterpoints to, uh, to the perception thing, I'm right there with you, too. It's like, yeah. there's so many, like, different points and counterpoints. It's like, there's no true, clear answer. It's like, and that's what makes it frustrating, I think, because I can never get to, like, um a common like uh, agreement because I'm not sure what I agree with, you know, it's like, right. there's just not enough information yeah. for me to, a lot of times people ask me, they go, okay, well, you write about ghosts. Surely you must believe in ghosts. No, I don't. I, I don't know. How can I say I believe in something that I don't have enough information on? Yep. I, I know something exists, but I cannot conclusively say that ghosts are spirits of dead people the way that we believe them to be or that aliens are from, outer space mm. you know i i just can't mm-hmm. there's just not enough evidence to support it yet not enough evidence to not support it you know um something is existing what that something is i have no idea that was justin bamforth blogger, podcaster, and author of the book, The Spectrum, Glimpses of the Paranormal and Encounters with the Strange. You can purchase either the paperback or Kindle version of his book online at Amazon.com. We've provided a link on our show notes page. I'm Marsha Barnhart, your host for this episode 14 of API Conversations, which is a spin-off of API Case Files. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. The spoken content of API Conversations is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license. The theme music for API Conversations is by DJ Spooky and is licensed under Creative Commons. Also featured was the composition Trapped by Quincis Moriara. Check out our other API Conversation podcasts as well as API Case Files at www.apicasefiles.com. Meanwhile, thanks for joining us. And we hope you recommend API Case Files and API Conversations to your friends and acquaintances.